welcome to our next edition of our Beers and Bites podcast. Uh, with us today is our special guest, Mo Cashman, coming all the way from Holland. And we have our normal moderators, Chris Jordan from Fluency and Jeremy Murdershaw from Fortify 24 by 7. Thank you and welcome. And gentlemen, what beers did you bring today? All right, you can be good, Jeremy. Hey, go ahead. Start out? <laughs> all right, well, today I've got... Uh, Two just in case, but yeah. we'll start with the uh, the the offshoot. It's another. Uh, I'm into this hazy IPA trend. I can't get off of it. And then just in case we run over time, I got the, the backup hazy LA IPA. The La Ipa. All right. Ooh. Well, I got I got a elegy, which kind of looks like eulogy. It means to lament the dead, and. Uh, We'll see how it goes. A hazy imperial diet. You know, we're going to do an interview with some beer meister or master sometime and find out what's the difference between an imperial double IPA, a double IPA, and an imperial IPA. So there's tons of them. And there, I've seen a triple IPA. So okay. oh. and then back up beer, the last of my um, cherry blossom beer from, from the festival that never occurred. Now, now see, Mo, they, these guys are, are double cans, and I'm a single kind of can guy. Uh, what did you bring today, Mo? <laughs> I brought uh, uh, Left Blanc, and uh, you know, being here in uh, in the Hague, you get um, a, a great selection of of Belgian beers, both Trappist and and, and Abbey beers. And uh, this is one of my favorites. It's a um, it's a triple. It's a little bit stronger, but it's got a nice a nice taste. But I'll tell you, I've got a, uh, I spent my uh, my fiftieth birthday, which was last year. Um, my wife did did a, uh, a great surprise. Um, present for me she bought me a brewery tour with some friends in the in the Ardennes and we, we went to the La Chouf brewery and I have some uh, some I, I heard Chris talk about cherries I have cherry beer over here in my uh, in my storage room that's still um still from last year so hey, I might have ready, to crack that open if we need to it's a it was a great trip I need to I need to open it up wide for uh, for the next time for more people because it was just uh, fantastic awesome <laughs> Yeah, well, we're gonna today I brought program. another Texas beer. It's Daymaker. And with that, gentlemen. Cheers. Mo, you're going to go Cheers. a little bit more into the beer. So so over there, one of the things I, I used know. to love about that Mecca was, especially Germany, is every town had their own brewery, their own beer. You go in there, you get, you get the glass, right? The infamous uh, yeah. marker that makes sure you get enough beer when they pour you a beer. Um, he did the beer tours. I mean, it's beautiful over there. I can't, I don't think I'd, I'd ever return if I had an option to stay. <laughs> and uh, and, and that, that's pretty much the story of my life, Chris. <laughs> I came here, never left. <laughs> awesome. In fact, one, one second. One second. What? Speaking of, uh, I just have a special treat for you guys. So this is a, 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 a beer stein, yeah, a, kind of a classic one. Actually, a, a really classic one. It's from Villaroy and Bach. Um, it's about um, 100 years old or so. Uh, wow. Another great Christmas gift uh, from from the years years past. But uh, the, so the, the these are pretty. Um, well, you get beer steins, of course, in Germany, but this is uh, one of the more decorative ones. I thought that was a pretty good collector's piece. <laughs> nice. Oh wow! Now we're going to open it up to beer memorabilia. <laughs> I'm going to have a oh, Budweiser no, yeah. sign <laughs> above my head here or something. I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we need to. Uh, if this is the thing, I like this thing. I'm coming back, Chris. Yeah, yeah. This is basically we just sit around, we drink, and uh, yeah. we do talk about beer. We we, we really gotta on our thing. We're gonna go out to some micro brews eventually once the weather gets warm and quarantine comes over or gets over. You know, I'm looking forward to the end of it. And we're gonna up our games. We're gonna get uh, hockey jerseys with our new logo. We're gonna show our logo out, and uh, yeah, we're gonna go the whole Canadian hockey drinking with security. As the side conversation. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's that's the that's the best thing. <laughs> so have a party and, and have security come around. <laughs> there you go. So Mo, if you want to take a few minutes and just let our audience know who you are and what you do, and that would be terrific. Sure. Uh, yeah, Mo Cash, and I um, you know, currently I'm, I'm a principal engineer here at uh, at McAfee Security, and. I, I've been uh, been with Mac about ten years, ten years now. But um, you know, you know, just prior to um, and that's and that's where I met Chris. Actually, the first 
within the first, uh, um, my first year in McAfee, I was um, a consultant on one of our projects and, and Chris came through to McAfee on, on an acquisition and he had, you know, the, uh, the Endeavor product was, um, I, I thought it was awesome because uh, I was always into detection and response. I, I had led a security operations team, you know, for a, for a, um, a defense, a defense sector customer in a previous an role. member too, uh, you? I really loved that job. And what's that? You were a regional, you were an ACER, a regional ACER, aren't you? Army Computer Emergency Response Team? was in a regional CERT, that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Regional Emergency Response Team. Um, so part of the, the whole uh, U.S. Army uh, CERT program, which Chris, I think was, um, you were you were back, and that was even going back in, in uh, first time, in I think you were, that was in the late 90s even, yeah. first time we yeah. met, yeah. <laughs> I started that, that job in 90s. And uh, those are the regionals, I think, in 92. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And uh, yes, yeah, so that was my first job actually was security analyst for, uh, for an RSER doing, uh, working I think on the first commercial IDS, so Real Secure 1.0, I remember. Oh my uh, God. We had, uh, yeah, all those things. So lo lo love that. I still, I still think about that job as, uh, as, as one of the best ever because you had so many learning opportunities. Um, so many, you know, security was just so uh, becoming so important. Uh, to um, you know, to everything really, and especially in the military, uh, the military mission. You know, we were one of the first to uh, to take you know cybersecurity out into the battlefield, even so into missions and so forth. So uh, that was um, that was pretty fun. In fact, I, I remember my boss. Uh, we were doing the interviews uh, for new candidates, and uh, I, I was getting excited. I'm like, "Yeah, you get to deploy to Bosnia and deploy IDSs on the network." And he's like, "Whoa." I don't know that everybody likes that. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I do. So it's some good stuff. And, you know, within McAfee now, I have, I, you know, I, uh, I lead a team of, uh, of solution architects, um, get to get to work on, on corporate strategy, a company strategy and direction, particularly as, as it pertains to, uh, to security, security operations. Uh, and I really love it. I have a great team. Uh, you know, we do a lot of good things for our customers and, and actually we, we build a lot of, you know, we really make, I think we really make security operational, you know, for our customers, right? Proving that it works, putting, you know, building systems, you know, you know, doing integrated, integrated design. So I'm, I couldn't be, um, could be happier with that. That's a great kind of lead into having a conversation is making security operational on. So, so both Jeremy and I love operational security, right? We're not, yeah. we might talk compliance and I've done compliance for a number of years at one point, but I love operational security. I just think it's it's fun. You get to see everything. It's one of those things where you get to see if products actually work, right? <laughs> you get to deploy something and see if it works. So I yeah. saw you won an award. Do you win a type of innovation award or something out of the UK or something weird? You win too many awards, don't you? <laughs> uh, I don't know. If, I don't know if it's an award, but it was. It was. Um, yeah, you know, last year I. I um, yeah, I really I was I really set out to, you know, improve my 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 public speaking you know ability, right? And I and I, I really worked on it, and I went to several different you know, large conferences uh, around around Europe uh, in, in particular. And um, you know, the theme I used was because yeah, I, I I think the best part of public speaking or the, the best public speakers, you know, they, they bring authenticity to, you know, to the to the to the table. And I really wanted to, uh, to you know, to think about something that really spoke to me. And, you know, and, and I believe in this theme of resilience, um, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's cyber resilience, personal resilience, team resilience, just, just in, in, in general. And, and I really believe in that combination of, um, of kind of art and architecture. And in fact, I, I called it art, art architecture, which was, you know, bringing that design thinking into something, something technical. So um, I use the theme of rethinking security uh, and re-architecting for resilience, actually, um, as a theme, and it was uh, I, I did a few a few uh, conference uh, conference engagements with that theme, and and I thought it was well received, and uh, I, and and I think you know you know you love the content when you step on the stage, and all of a sudden boom, AV's gone, and you just keep going right, and and that, and that that actually happened, <laughs> and uh, and then, and that was um it was a pretty large large room and and large conference actually, and uh, but I, I just love the content so much I was just kind of powered through that. <laughs> So on the resilience, I mean, are you talking about like, let's bring up what everybody's talking about today, COVID-19 and the change of architecture, right? Yeah. 
So the facility and the remote office are pretty much gone. Everybody's logging in remotely. You've got a lot of cloud services and mobile apps all of a sudden kick in high gear. Mm -hmm. So how things are going that way with the clients and does that play into the resiliency you were thinking about or is that just a whole new level? Oh yeah, I, abs absolutely. Cause I think, you know, um, the theme of, of resilience is as top of mind for, for every organization today. And, and if you didn't think about that before, you're certainly thinking about it now because uh, you know, security is, and, and security is such a critical piece because you couldn't, the, the businesses essentially couldn't operate unless you had, you know, at least, you know, good, good security capability in place, you know, device controls, cloud security controls, you're delivering an equivalent level of protection out to, you know, your mobile, mobile workers that are going direct to internet. Right. And, you know, and, and I think it also speaks to, um, uh, you, you know, the other, the other areas of security, you know, that we sometimes, that we sometimes forget about, which is, which is culture you know, for one yeah. thing. Right. And, and bringing, you know, bringing people together and, and making them feel part of the part of the business uh, and part of the security mission, which is actually even, even more critical uh, these days because, you know, you're at home, there's lots of distractions and, you know, you want to make sure that, that data security and device security, physical device security even are, are, are top of mind. Uh, and, and you want to know that your workers know who to call, right? You know, how, how are they, you know, most people aren't, Aren't, aren't malicious, right? They just want to get the job done. And uh, so they know who to call when they see a problem. So you bring up the culture concept and let's get, let's date myself and my relationship with McAfee. When, when I was at McAfee, McAfee was literally everything. We were down, we were probably selling underwear at yeah. one time. I mean, we were everything from the <laughs> desktop to the server, right? And now McAfee's gone through a couple yeah. of different iterations that went, went through the Intel private equity selling off a good portion of the, of the portfolio and revamping. So what is the McAfee culture and how does it engage a customer now is what's, what's changed. And, and let me just be blunt about it. Why buy McAfee today? I mean, out of all yeah. people I can ask, I know I'll get an honest answer from you. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I think you're, and, and you know, the history, Chris, and, and, you, and you're pretty spot on there. Um, I, I think you know, we, we've, yeah, it's about three years since the um, spin out from uh, from Intel, and, and I think we're you know, if from a security point of view, I, I I'm feeling really I'm feeling really good because the the strategy that we had invest have invested in, which is essentially, you know, thinking about where the, you know, where controls were going to be needed the most at the device level at the cloud because those are the the critical control points and things had to be cloud native. Um, you know, we we've. I think our strategy is starting to is, is resonating a lot with customers you know, these days that that device to cloud kind of you know, with simple simplified management across simplified policy management you know across those platforms and I think what's what speaks to me and this is something that, that I'm very passionate about and, and continue to 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 kind of work on within the company is is I think we can we win with architecture right and and I'm starting to see that you know with that with the, with the investments we made in in cloud security controls, not just in in CASB, but data protection, container security, you know, and, and a lot of automation capability for, you know, for uh, you know, for AppSec in particular, or for doing security hygiene, um, you know, we're starting to have those architecture conversations. So I, I go, I don't go into a customer and say, I want to, I want to talk to you about anti malware. I want to talk to you about you know workplace security, you know, architecture, or I want to talk to you about um, you know data security architecture, not just you know, DLP or CASB. So we're getting there, right? I think that's, that's the most, ex I, personally, Chris, and, and you know, you know me for many years, that's, that's what gets me excited and, and to be able to, cause that's what the customers think about. You know, we're, we're, we're putting that, we're putting that forward. We're not, we're not all the way there. We're not all the way there mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but I think we're I'm seeing really good signs that, that that conversation is going to be how we win, you know, going forward. You know, customers have a lot to, of choices. Right? You know? Yeah. Not to make you say any, corporate secrets or anything, but is McAfee going to yeah. do an acquisition strategy to fill in the gaps? Or do you think they're going to try to start some internal, you know, projects and innovation? I think, um, well, we, well, we, we have, we, we do both, uh, honestly. And, and uh, I think the, you know, the strategy is, and you've probably seen it with, um, we made an acquisition a company called Nanosec, which was in the container space, you know, um, small company, Hot, you know, really strong technology, something that integrates 
well, right? And I think going back years, you know, the strategy, we've always had sort of a strategy of integration, but it only really now is that strategy of integration, you know, real right or is, is real in terms of you know delivering to the customers we always you can always you know we can always put two and two two products together and make them talk together right but that doesn't that doesn't necessarily you know deliver the outcome that the customer is looking for you know they're looking for a solution that that works together so i think the yeah. technology acquisitions that we that we made nanosec being one of those um there was also a uh, um it was, it was a ux company i believe uh, again small technology investments um we, we made a recent acquisition of Lightpoint in the zero trust space. So that is, you know, again, small technology, you know, not, not that big, but fits into our, our strategy of what, what can we build on top of Envision, integrates well, and also, you know, moves the, moves the holistic strategy. I think we're, we're consistent in that, um, you know, in that approach. And, you know, in, in terms of innovation, uh, I think two things, and this is, this is all known, which is, one is, is called uh, Unified Cloud Edge. And I think that's, that speaks really well to the, the theme of remote working. So unifying you know, Secure Web Gateway, data protection, CASB under single policy management, that's, that's organic innovation. Um, and, and I think in the areas of Intel as well, there's um, Insights is a, is a new product we, we announced last year, but it's coming to market uh, really soon here again. Organic innovation. Um, on, on both sides. So I, I like that strategy more, honestly, more so than let's go, let's go get a big company because then you just, you know, so do you mix I'm or curious, not? Right. <laughs> I'm curious, Jeremy, from your perspective, you know, being an advanced MSSP, from what you're hearing, what, what's your thoughts on that? And what questions would you have for Mo regarding? Huh. My actually, my question is as a former Intel employee, right? Um, you, me and, and me it, or, or you? <laughs> me. Yeah, I was, I, uh, <laughs> Intel hired me and I worked there for a few years uh, for Y2K and beyond, right? I was part of the okay. Intel.com strategy. I worked for uh, Doug Bush and Sandra Morris over there. And, uh, you know, I was building data centers for them all over the world. So my question to you is what did you like about being acquired by Intel? What did you not like about being acquired by Intel and how has that overall experience changed or shaped McAfee's culture? That's a, that's a, that's a really interesting question going back. Yeah. To think uh, going back a little bit, um, I'll tell you what I loved um, about Intel, which was the company itself, right? I mean, it's, Great, a great place to work. They, they, it's an engineering company. So technical people were, you know, were very well respected, well treated. Not, not everyone, everyone at Intel, honestly, is, is pretty, at least from my perspective, is pretty, pretty well treated and a you know, great company to work for, a lot of support there. Um, you know, I think the, that mix of security on, you know, I, I think that, you know, there, there, there was a cultural, some, sometimes a cultural mismatch there. You know, you know cybersecurity have to be very, very agile. Especially today, I mean, you know, look at all the look at all the companies out there coming up, you know, one after another. Um, so you have to be very agile to tackle the new threats and be be on top of things, and, and sometimes aggressive, like um, getting out there and, and talking about competition or you know talking about you know the threats, and 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 sometimes those those kind of conversations may may not go you know didn't fit maybe with the Intel culture, right? So being aggressive and agile, you know, they're 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 agile in other ways, but maybe in cyber was. Sure you know, that, that long-term mindset was, um, you know, w was good and bad. Let's just put it that way. Uh, I, I think coming out, um, you know, we're a cloud first type company now. And so, you know, I, I, it was, it was easy for us to transition to sort of the work from home because, you know, we, everything is pretty much cloud, you know, all of our office systems, business systems, and even some of our design labs and so forth that my, our team uses, you know, all remotely accessible, um, either in AWS or, you know, on our own data center, what have you. So um, we're, we're used to it, but I know that that culture is not this, that, that easy transition is not the same for, for many, many people. So, so, so your takeaway was, is basically that it was a positive experience. You felt like it was, you were treated well as an engineer. As, and I agree, engineering is a yeah. respected trade within the Intel culture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a good, I, I think, think it was a fun experience overall. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, personally, I, I'm really only sp- you're speaking, you know, personally on this was that, um, you know, I did, I, I, I had some, you know, worked as sort of a strategist for for government, um, where was able to leverage my experience and in working in government as a practitioner to go and and, and promote you know cybersecurity in um, in different you know different national different foreign national governments. In fact, Chris and I made several trips together. Some you know talking to. Uh, I uh, won't name the names now, but um, you know, different, lots of different trips to some far-flung places where, uh, you know, where the high-tech nature, especially the, the products that, that Chris had brought to McAfee and, and Endeavor Security were, were really appreciated. That, the, that you, know, you know, advanced detection response capability, you know, yeah. that, was, uh, that was a lot of fun. I, I think, in, you know, Intel did bring a, 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 strong, a stronger engineering culture to McAfee. I think Prior to Intel acquisition, you know, McAfee was sales and marketing, right? With engineering, of course, in, in the consumer side and, and, and labs and so forth. So, of course, we had that. Yeah. Um, but it was, you know, really out in front. Acquisitions by a company, market it, you know, uh, work, you know, integrate, work to integrate it. And I think Intel, I think, brought, and this is my perspective again, brought a bit of um, organic uh, engineering um, culture into McAfee and a lot of the people that were, a lot of the people are still here. Many, many people, of course, competition's high. So we have, you know, people going different places, right? And that's, sure. that's always the same, but natural attrition, you know, engineering wise, quite a few, quite a few uh, longstanding you know, people in the engineering yeah, organization. I think, mm-hmm. You know, being there during that transition, uh, Intel was an engineering place, right? So McAfee was a sales place and McAfee's salesperson to, to engineer ratio was like a flip of Intel's. And so there was a cultural conflict between the yeah. two of them. There was a significant amount of downgrading of, of marketing because they felt that technology sells. And, and McAfee was always one that was used to the constantly marketing to the end consumer because security is such a, a marketing game, right? It, so, so, Mo, you brought this, this insight. Is that a product that you guys are selling now? So we yeah we now we announced it um, in our customer conference last year uh, so at Empower, and it's insights is um, I might have internet connectivity issues guys so no, we can hear uh, let me know um, good. still good okay yeah. Um, yeah it's coming out it's 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 coming to market you know, very soon here um, don't know don't have the exact date but it was uh, it's essentially thinking about um, you know sort of next level. Uh, you know, risk assessment, risk analysis, combining intelligence with with posture assessments to mm. you know give give a bit more predictive. I'll say I'll say prescriptive might be the better term. You know, in that in that sense, so prescriptive advice for you know for for customers and how to to reconfigure. Now, um, yeah, out of, out of the gate, it's gonna it has a certain you know set of features, but I think that's you know what customers are looking for is some. Um, you know, how, you know, threat intel automation is, is a topic that, that especially my team works on a lot. We work with, say, ThreatQ and McAfee, and we, we, we build different interoper- you know, integrated solutions to help, you know, help automate some of those, those threat intel tasks, the hunting tasks, for example. And I think with Insights, it's that it's kind of taking the threat intel, the, inf- the threat intel information, campaign information, combining that with you know, what is your current state, uh, and say, okay, these are these are the most you know critical threats. And 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 if I look back in in our in the A cert, Chris, in our cert, um, yeah. we had a process. We called it threat response. And essentially, we had a human you know team of of course we were fortunate to have <laughs> intelligence uh, capability, which was um, you know pretty organic and large. But we were able to do that you know real intel picture with cyber threat intel. With what is our posture, and and I remember every day having a stand up briefing um, for I, thirty yeah, thirty minutes know. to an hour. Yeah, where are we at risk? <laughs> and, Jeremy, and that's essentially the problem we're trying to solve with insights. I think the issue is, Jeremy, that uh, if you were ever to do business the way we did business, you couldn't afford the number of people. <laughs> just to be honest, that's I mean, right. there was no our idea of automation was turning around and saying, "Hey, have you seen this?" I mean, it was a different world. Um, yeah. you know, yeah. it, it was with briefings and papers and in the let communication was a lot discussion different. forward. Let's let's bring this discussion forward to today's environment with COVID, right? We we hear all of the things yeah. about life has changed as we knew it. 
we we know that for those of us who've been work at home employees for uh, many many years myself for almost 25 years in total now all of a sudden a lot of folks are now working from home as required uh, not only for the the quarantine perspective but we're hearing on the news that there's going to be a mass exodus of folks leaving the cities going out to the suburbs because they have discovered I don't have to come to an office in a congested city, right? And be exposed. I can now live in this environment. We see stores changing the way that their shopping is now going to be done for, for customers, right? We see restaurants, all mm -hmm. of these things are changing in the world of work from home. And now all of a sudden this explosion of internet usage and this blending, and I'm going to say blending between having corporate assets and corporate access from your home environment, to your mm -hmm. personal, right? What do you see are some of the, the couple of top challenges that companies are gonna face today in managing that whole new explosion of work from home? Yeah, no, I, I think it's, it's, it's funny because, um, you know, whenever there's something new, right? And, and not that work from home or mobile working is, is new, but uh, like whenever there's something new, you, you always find out that getting back to the basics is uh, <laughs> is missing, right? So, you know, think, and, and you might think this, it, you know, these are simple things, but just knowing, you know, the, you're having a secure configuration, for example, of your of your working device. And let's, let's keep it on the managed device side of things for a minute. Um, you know, that that's, you know, you might, you may say, well, at, in the office, I'm, I'm behind, you know, defense in depth capability. I've got all the controls in place. Everybody's there. Physical security, no problem. So, but when you go you know, from home, oh, do I have a secure configuration? Ooh. Uh, what was that? Yeah, that baseline config that I that I wanted to put on that device. And you know, we just did a blog, a uh, blog post, and we've got a webinar coming out actually on on this particular topic. So it's top of mind for me, which was just RD, RDP exposure, right? And RDP <laughs> credentials for sale. Um, you know, in the in the dark market and in other places where you know, credentials for sale, um, taking advantage of, you know, combining, combining that part, you know, the, the attacker with misconfigurations and you're like, oh man, that's, that's not a big problem. <laughs> thousands and thousands of credentials. Those are, those, those work devices are hot points into something else, oh, yes. right? Into, you know, into the inside of the network. If, if you're on a VPN, for example, or, you know, just as a, just as a hot point for a, you know, for a demand, for a denial service point or, you know, it's part of an amplifying attack or something. Um, but we've also seen that on the, you know, when you talk about access to, you're stealing other credentials, right? And accessing, you know, corporate cloud resources, for example, in Teams or Salesforce or wherever. So, the, you know, hijacking or getting, you know, getting uh, credential access is possible, you know, from, you know, once you have a foothold on, the, on somebody's machine, uh, that's that, you know, a lot of things become possible. Um, but, that's, and that, but that's more of the, the high side. Think about the next stage, ransomware. Like, um, how do, you know, you got, a, you got a, a remote user in South Dakota, he's got ransomware. How do you get him a new computer when there's no delivery? You know, you're not in touch with, uh, with things, you know, let's, let's just say you didn't stop it. Right. You, you gotta, you gotta recover from that somehow. Right. Is it simple things that you probably like, Oh, wow. Never thought that that would be a problem before, but you know, those kind of misconfigurations thinking, you know, thinking like the attacker and walking through those exercises, I think, um, that's going to be, I think that's going to be something we're going to see more exercises in these, in this construct. Like what if this happens? What if this happens? More of those simulation exercises. I see that, you know, coming around. Um, you know, other areas is, is the data security itself, right? So, uh, you know, being able to do secure collaboration, uh, having kind of cloud native controls that, you know, can see the, the see the activity. Um, you know, if you're not behind a corporate firewall and, and, and all the other controls you have there, visibility is, is, is missing. So where's your new visibility points? Uh, again, when you're, when you're, when you're totally going direct to direct to cloud, um, you're not going through VPN or, or anything like that. You've got new visibility points and, and some of those newer technologies, newer, uh, like EDR, for example, is not really new, but you know, the, the ability to have, um, you know, more, more visibility endpoint, more visibility in the cloud and cloud native visibility that is, um, is, is pretty critical. So we, we have seen that acceleration. We, we certainly anticipate a you know, larger acceleration to, to cloud services today, even in maybe even in areas that, you know, might have heavy regulatory you know, concerns or other types of concerns, or, or maybe have been slower to adopt. That'll probably accelerate, 
you know, those, um, their, their adoption, maybe in the, in the Eastern countries and uh, some of the other areas that have been hesitant to, you know, to adopt cloud for either privacy or security reasons. But I think that, that barrier is going to go away. You're going to have, and it's cloud native security is going to be really, really critical there. So Mo, as a, as our, one of our guests who live in a different country, I'm curious to step away from the beer and the cybersecurity aspect of the conversation and just ask about what is life like for you and how has the, the government in your country responded to coronavirus? And how do you think that is different or better than what we're seeing here in America or throughout other countries in Europe? Hmm. Well, I don't know if I, I, I think, um, First off, I, I, I'm very fortunate, you know, from, from where we live and, you know, we're the, um, you know, we're close to the beach. Um, so there's, you, you, you can go there. I, I think one, one thing about Europeans and, and I'm an, obviously I'm, a, I'm from the U.S. originally born in Philadelphia, uh, lived overseas for, for the majority of my working life, um, my adult life, I should say, in various, various, various places. Um, you know, Europeans are, are very respectful, right, in general, right, where, the social distancing, it's, it's, it, it, it's done, right? It's done. People are do it themselves, right? And, and the Netherlands in particular, the, the Dutch culture is really self-reliance, right? So they take you know, a lot of personal responsibility, if I might say. Um, so there, there's, a, there's an expectation, you know, uh, of personal responsibility. And, and also the, you know, the medical system is, um, you know, is really is, is quite strong, right? And, in terms of the services, so I, I don't know the numbers, the stats, and, and I don't know at, you know you know how to compare government reactions or anything like that. I'll just say that um, you know personal personal responsibility is important to the Dutch and, and that the, to to the people here. And, and and as a resident here, I'm I you know, kind of adopted that that culture. Um, we respect the laws. We do we follow it. The um, so so I think it's been it's been it's been a good response. Mm-hmm. And I will say this: I, I I saw. I don't know if you know about about this about about Netherlands, but there was a project. Uh, I think it just just about just about ended. It was called Room for the River, right? And it's essentially um, you know the history of Holland, of course, with the dikes and and the overflows and the uh, you know the, the flooding of the dikes and, and the, you know it's just a it's the country's underwater, so it's, it's a high flood risk all the time, right? So managing and living with water uh, is is a is a Dutch you know. Uh, it's the expertise is the wrong word. It's something more than expertise. It's, it's in their DNA. Right. right. And, they, and they export that to New Orleans and, and other places, right. To go and help build the, those right architectures. But the, the room for the river project was about resilience. It wasn't about stopping building higher barriers and, and, and so forth. It was about uh, living with the water. Right. And, and creating uh, aesthetically pleasing, um, you know, solutions to managing the flow of water in, in a, in a, uh, in a flood period, for example, um, and, and new ways of living, you know, houses, you know, on stilts. I mean, so, so it was, it was a resilience project essentially, was, or the fundamental of the project was about building resilience and not about building barriers. So I, I think they've taken that same approach here, which is, you know, a balanced set of controls. You know, people are empowered to, to be self, um, um, you know, self-reliant or, or self, you know, self-responsible or responsible for themselves. Um, in terms of you know obeying the laws and, and the social distancing and but things have been open the grocery stores have been open uh, some shops have been open um, many things have been closed of course but I, I think the people really have that resilient culture that's just boom we do what we need to do we get through this uh, and, and and we move forward but the, there's a sense of you know everyone is working together on that project right and I don't know their full strategy uh, honestly um, but I, I think you know, I, I trust, you know, what they're going to, you know, the, the decisions that they make, I think are, are, are based in, uh, in fact, in science and, sure. you know, and, and, and the people will, will enact those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Have you eaten out? That's my, that's my, uh, it could be, it could be worse in some areas. <laughs> I think, you know, from my it's, it's, it's not, it may not be all roses, you know, and I'm sure it's not. Um, sure. It, it isn't. Many people have, have, have lost their life and, and we can't forget that. Um, but, you know, I think overall the, the, yeah, the resilience is uh, is a Dutch trait. A you know, Dutch it's interesting. Trait, I say here here in the American media, we hear oh the you know you go to go to Holland or 
and you can you can eat inside of a bubble inside of a restaurant. Um, I don't know if that is just American media hype or if that's an actuality <laughs> or have you tried that? Is that real? I don't know. It sounds like it would be hot. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, no, I, 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 I'll tell you that the, the um, one thing I've, I've learned about, about the Dutch is that they are very creative um, and, and adaptable, right? So again, resilience characteristics, right? Creativity and, and adaptability. Are, are there. So I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, and Amsterdam is a pretty fun place. Um, you know, a lot of things, but it's, and, but it's not just there. I mean, Rotterdam or the Hague or other places in, in, in Holland also have, you know, unique, art, unique cultures and unique, uh, unique things. So I wouldn't be surprised, honestly, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. And, and then I have my last, uh, you know, question regarding um, yeah. your, your living why the yeah. when it's just hey why the the why is the the there have you know, well, well, lived there for is, a while is, is, yeah <laughs> you'd think i know that right um so it's well the name is den Haag, right so that's that's uh the full name of uh of the of the town right and 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 actually it's it's uh there's another another name for it which is difficult for me to, to pronounce <laughs> so I won't, I won't embarrass myself right now <laughs> um, but there's, there's some more <laughs> ways there, but then, then, Den Haag is, is the name. And, and honestly, I mean, you know, when I, when I moved here was, um, you know, I was, I was doing government strategy, sort of evangelism, you know, for, you know, for cyber in, in government. And I'm like, wow, I'm going to Hey, that's the seat of government. That's the, that's the place, uh, that's the place to be. And, and it's, it is, it is cool like that. And, but that name has just grown on me. I, I just love it. The Hey. It is so cool. <laughs> I love saying that, right? Is there another Hague? <laughs> nah, I, there probably is somewhere, right? <laughs> well, probably in the U.S. Well, There's probably a town in Pennsylvania called the Hague. Let's <laughs> take a step back then, too, from a, a technical perspective. I, I hear a lot of people talking about all, all of these old-school signature methodologies, right, of, of doing security, intelligence, and protection and stuff really are going away in that everything is moving towards a real-time anomaly-based detection. What are your thoughts on that? I, I, I think um, I, 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 that's always the, the, the thing in security, right? Like whatever you had before was not good enough. You need to do this now, right? And that's, that's one of those, um, at least from my perspective, one of those, those things that I, that I try to avoid in saying, look, uh, forget that, you know, because I think everything comes, you know, is there's a balance there, right? I certainly believe that you have to be more adaptable, right? But I like that combination of signatures, analytics, and intelligence to come together, right? And, and so I think, you know, signatures aren't, aren't dead. Um, there are fast, it's, it's, it's all about the decision, right? So fast path, um, you know, if I can block something with a signature, why not, right? If I can do that, that's fine. Just don't rely just on that part, right? Um, you know, think about your defense in depth capability, right? And where, where else do you have both that, that, co that good combination of signatures, analytics, and intelligence working together? Your web gateways is a critical control point. Web gateway cloud, cloud you know, services, secure web gateways uh, are, are critical, but they have to combine, you know, signatures with behavior, with intelligence, with interoperability. Um, you know, so, that, so those things have to come together. And, and I think today is some um, conversation that comes up you know, zero trust, uh, which is you know being applied, you know that kind of concept also being applied to say you know browsers, browser isolation is, is part of that. Um, but there's been some companies like Deep Secure, uh, a small partner company of ours, but they do um, uh, sort of zero trust for for data and content. Um, you know all those those kind of those kind of um, and then in the cloud space, of course, you know zero trust and with the SASE conversation. You know, zero trust is, uh, is, is, is in there. So it's, it's, that's becoming top of mind. But I, what I fear is that you're going to see that signatures weren't good enough. Analytics, no, that's not good enough. Everything's got to be zero trust. Maybe, maybe we'll get, maybe that's, that is the case. But um, I, I think it's going to be that balance, which is, which is critical. But definitely, you know, from a marketing side, if you say AI, well, you know, used to be, you, you, get, you get in front of the customer. But when you break it down, you know, where, where are those analytics being applied? What kind of machine learning are you using? And, you know, where, where are you applying analytics to make a faster decision? 
And, and I think you know today, those analytics need to be applied to other types of decision making, like in the SOC or in you know access control or in learning and, and other things. So I think that's that's the key thing. Yeah, all all those areas come together, but we got to balance things. Yeah, I, le- I learned that from Chris, by the way. When I looked at the 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 uh, the, the uh, AMP architecture. You, you think about that, and, you, and you're, I think even in fluency, right? You've got great sensoring combined with great analytics and intelligence on top of that, kind of coming exactly. together to make a you know faster decision at the point of attack or at the point where an analyst um, you know needs to make a call. Yeah, thank you. Know, for the I, I, next I level, I agree. So, with you, yeah. I mean, listen, nobody has all the answers, and the really key to good security is learning how to leverage what you have, right? I mean, and the reality is, is yeah. like, we'll, we'll get into the argument sometime now around signatures because we'll, we'll we'll go into first, second degree, third degree version of categorization of knowledge and stuff. But you know, one yeah. one thing that McAfee used to be really good at. Because Mac had a lot of products. Unfortunately, you know, the, the, the overall vision wasn't there. Now you have a stronger vision, yet they're going to be filling in the gaps, right? I mean, you don't have the same yeah. ecosystem that Mac B used to have. And so, and the question is, and I don't want to put Mo on the spot, right? Because I don't want to be fired. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, but the question really is, is that, you know, Mac B sold off, a significant amount of technology that was facility oriented. They sold off firewalls, they sold off URL filtering, right? They sold off technology that was more or less around the brick and mortar world. And they began focusing more on the desktop and cloud services, right? Now they still have some weak points mm-hmm. and I'm not gonna point them out because like I said, I don't want Mac, you know, Oh, I already know this needs to get a legal review, Chris. So no more about it. Right? I'll call it out. I think that that Nitro ESM is a a, a portfolio. It's it's having a hard time moving to the cloud. It's 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 database B, what we call B tree tree structured. They they're really having some significant issues. And the guys in the back end just say, I'll just throw Elastic at it, right? And they're not trying to solve the problem, they're trying to integrate themselves out of a problem, right? So, but the McAfee portfolio has definitely shifted towards a more modern architecture. There's no doubt about it. That, that, that we, what used to be, when we say CASB, which we didn't define in this meeting right here, for this podcast, right? So it was cloud access security yeah. broker? Brokers, yeah. Okay, it is really more around cloud mm-hmm. services. And it replaced the URL filtering techniques that we used to have. It was really designed to kind of look at the exchange of data from the person to shadow IT. That was originally intent. And, and it's blossomed into this whole new other industry, right? But my big thing to you, Mo, is, is that you're looking at this now, you're definitely growing a new portfolio. The PE, the private equity invested in McAfee is growing something brand new. It's growing something that's more around a modern architecture I would really, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm interested in the insight. I'm going to do some research after this, after this call. I'm going to, I'm going to look into more of this, this insight. I, I'm, I'm really interested in McAfee's roadmap because I don't think the PE is being dumb. I think they're, as you said, targeting the future. You're saying this is where the future is going to be. What is it should be in our portfolio in this, this future event, right? And so mm-hmm. insights, what, what do you really love in your portfolio? Sky High, which is your CASB, which you just call CASB now, you don't call it Sky High? Uh-oh. I think I lost Mo. Yeah, he, he's frozen at the moment, but there he nope, goes. He there back. he is. Back. Yeah. <laughs> we'll try it again. So, so Mo, the question is, is it is it Sky High or is it CASB? And, and what is the... The, what do you think is going to be the product suite that you like the most? What do you like out of McAfee's product suite? Because I, I really want to talk about McAfee and, and the product suite because McAfee's always mm-hmm. had very good customer. Let's just be honest about it. Regardless of how you feel about McAfee, they were awesome in engaging the customer. And they mm-hmm. always mm-hmm. cared a lot about the product they were pushing out to, to their customers. So 
What is the yeah. customer suite that McAfee focuses on today? What, what do you feel is your premier suite where you yeah. go and say, I don't care what you have, this is what you need as your base? Uh, yeah, I, I think um, I, I certainly from from what what the architect team does, we'll say, and I, I'll speak you know from that angle right now. Um, you know, we, we try to take that top down approach, right? Which is, you know, we've got a portfolio, we've got, a, and we've got integration partners that are, that are there. Um, we know the problems that you're, that you, Mr. Customer are faced with, you know, secure and remote working. Great example. Um, improving your stock maturity, you know, great, great example. Um, in, in empowering or accelerating some, some journey towards, towards cloud, you know, towards cloud service adoption, whether that's, Sort of that lift and shift stuff, lift and shift. You're moving, moving your apps out, or or adopting you know SaaS, right? For for other reasons, right? Business acceleration is usually the the, the main driver, uh, and and agility. So, you know those those things. We we try to say, okay, well, CASB is not you know from an architect team perspective or architecture perspective, you know, solutioning. Um, you know, it's it's control, data protection, network security you know, anti-malware protection, the whole suite. How do you put that together to say, look, because cloud security is not, certainly not just CASB. There's a DLP component there. There's a, there's an endpoint component to that with uh, the controls, the access control. There's a, there's obviously a network component to that. You know, how do you integrate, whether you're inline or API, are you native? Uh, there's, there's lots of um, integration points. So we try to take that. And, and I think this is where, you know, in, in, ter in terms of the culture of the company, we want, that's one thing I'm working towards is I think that should be everybody's starting conversation. Um, I, I think if you say what's the flagship product out there, certainly, you know, it's Envision cloud, right? But that's a lot of things, right? That's, that's CASB. That's the, that's the data protection, you know, management that we do. That's, um, you know, cloud native application security, right? So that's infrastructure protection as well as, uh, uh, AppSec, right? With, um, you know, container security and workload security and so forth. So, We've got to, so I think that's certainly the, the, a flagship um, or unified cloud edge would be, it's more of that combination of uh, DLP, CASB and web gateway under, under pol you know, single policy management. If you, if you truly want to say what's the hottest thing, then, mm -hmm. then that's probably it, right? Um, you know, I, I personally love, you know, EDR and, and you know, the conversation, you know, Oh, you're breaking up a little bit, buddy. Yeah, you know, we've got to do some things there um, strong. And you, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, like the, I like that the miter testing that came out recently, and that's I know that's kind of controversial, but um, you, you know, you, you miter doing a great job of of testing, you know, the the, the products. And I think it, it is it is operationalizing security, right? Because it's thinking from the red side. It's here's the techniques where you get visibility and so forth. Um, but you know. A lot of vendors use that data in different ways, right? And say, okay, just to to, to market to market uh, market themselves a little differently, right? But um, you know, when it comes down to the operational effectiveness, we were pretty strong in that uh, in, in the in the results. How Forrester looked at it. There was a report just from Forrester um, that I saw a blog post on today. You know, put us pretty high um, from their score from their mechanism. So we we, we th I try to think about the outcomes, and I, I encourage the the team to think about you know. SecOps is is not just detection; it's detection, triage, investigations, response. It's those things in a cycle. So think about the outcome. How can you affect the outcome? Um, you know, whether it's with you know, there's there's always going to be a technology piece to that that we that we lead with, but we try we try to lead with the outcome. At least that's um, w what I you expect from the yeah. the the architect team for sure. <laughs> so. So Mo, you're going to go ahead and get us some customers for Jeremy and I to, to run your EDR solution again. <laughs> I got to figure that out. Yeah, that's a, you know, I run into Chris once in a while at conferences with like you know RSA or or other places, and uh, I, I like you know I, I if I don't mind if I'd like to just hear you know quickly what's uh, you know what's what's top of mind for you, Chris, and, and fluency, you know. Man, Jeremy, I think like, first of all, Jeremy and I tied to the hip more than I, I realized at times. I mean, <laughs> here, here's, here's what's happening in the universe. Yep. Is we used to get a lot of traction in these conferences and, and believe it or not, the smaller conferences and the bigger conferences, it's too much about how much glitz you can put onto a market floor. And 
and part of these podcasts is to try to change the dynamics right now because we don't have the ability to talk to people anymore. Mm. But I do feel that here's what's happening though is, is that we invested so much in an infrastructure of brick and mortar and primary and, and small business you know, locations that we're ill-equipped to handle split tunneling and SD-WAN, mobile devices, mm. cloud security, to tell you the truth, is, is still not very good. And our focus is how do we get information across a distributed environment? So I, I talk a lot about what we call the double Ds, and I'm not talking boobies. It's, <laughs> it's distribution <laughs> and diversity of product. And what we're finding is a lot of our customers, they got stay-at-home workers now. And we just had a call with a health company this morning. I was on it. And we were showing them their data. And the guy goes, I got somebody in Atlanta? They're not supposed, nobody's supposed to be in Atlanta. And so we clicked through and poor Mike, we, we created trouble for poor Mike because Mike's in Atlanta and he didn't put in any travel plans, but he's, hopefully it's Mike, reading documents and stuff like that. And I think you're asking me what's big in my life right now. It changed. It changed two months ago that before I was all about vision of your network and vision of what you have. And now there's no doubt about it. It's, it's vision. If I took away your firewall and I took away your flow data, how do you control your network? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the reason why I was interested in your insight. That's the reason why yeah. I, I really am interested in what you're saying, Mo, because Okay. I don't okay. believe in CASB mm -hmm. anymore. I believe in endpoints. Mm -hmm. I believe in cloud product security and audit management, right? I yep. Yep. believe in the double Ds, the distributed networks and diverse products. I think that, yep. I believe that you, we said it early on. I like what everybody else in the universe has and I want to listen to them. And if I go in there mm -hmm. saying buy my products up and down, the spreadsheet, which you can't do anymore with McAfee. So I feel comfortable no. saying this with you. You can't, you can't do that really with anybody, right? It's a, uh, no. it's tough. Uh, I mean, might be, if you're one trick pony, maybe you can, that people do it, but uh, it's customers are uh, different these days, right? Uh, I, I would say a lot more informed buyer, right? Although they have a lot of choices. Um, they're still quite an informed, they're a more informed and tougher, tougher audience, right? They're, they're more about prove it, right? Versus, you're believing the marketing. That's for sure. I do think you're sure. This is my experience. Yeah. yeah, no, no, you're hand, you're right on the money. And I think that every single one of our engagements along with Jeremy is a, is a POC. It's prove yeah. it to me, show me what's going on. And then the worst part is how do I get out of my current contract? I made a mistake. <laughs> it's, that's <literally laughs> the next issue. The next issue is, Oh my God, I bought, and I won't say a product name. I brought X for the next two years. And I paid $3 million and they're realizing yeah. it's not going to answer the bill. And it's right. what I think right now, what's happening in our industry is, is that we like to say you can't fire, but be fired by buying Cisco. You can be, you're going to yeah. get a breached, you know, and, and that's, and I'm not picking on Cisco, but my reality is, is that, you know, you hear, that's the phrase I hear. Can't be fired by hiring, buying Cisco. Yeah, yeah. Listen, we've ran into great products. Peplink being a product with West Networks. We did a podcast with those guys. Mm -hmm. Great products out there that are outperforming Cisco. And, and yep. it's like anything, right? You've got to have you got to have those layers all in play, as was talked about earlier. And then we, as a catcher's mitt, right, bring all of that together and bring you that that intelligence and that knowledge. I don't yeah. have the money. I don't have the money, Mo, but if you, if you were to go to your PE and you were saying, PE, what's your strategy right now? I'd buy no before. Wouldn't you, Jeremy? Every meeting we we Kevin, about, no before. Just, is, just, just to have Kevin Mitnick, right? Just to have Kevin Mitnick. <laughs> Kevin's, you know, Kevin's a sweet Actually, the, o the only reason why I, not that's the only reason, but one yeah. of the reasons why I partnered with uh, no before was because they were giving out this credit card size lockpick lock set. Yeah, I got it. I've got awesome. like six or seven from Kevin. Every time I meet Kevin, he gives me one. It's like between him and his handler, Kevin has to have a handler. Kevin's a sweet guy. He's got a great girlfriend. I hope they get married. He was talking about his 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 movie, and he's like, I never hit anybody. And he put in his thing, I can't hit people or shoot people or throw trash cans at people. And they're like, and they, they're arguing whether they could put that in the paper in the movie because they want a movie 
exciting, something he has to do something mean. He's too nice of a guy yep. to do something mean, <laughs> right? Let me just let me be honest about it. And so, listen, mm. I think Novi Four is a is is a solid company. We bring Novi Four yeah. up a lot. Yeah. We like Checkpoint Sandblaster, right? We think that's a Sand great mobile agent. It, it just Sandblast Mobile comes yeah. out of that sucker. Yeah, yeah. And so mm -hmm. my point is, is that Mo, where are we going, and, and and why are you, Jeremy, and I talking to you, is mm -hmm. because we love this industry we're tired of the industry being about what gartner thinks and what forrester thinks yeah and yeah. we want to kind of reach out and, and go from person to person and say mm -hmm. what are you seeing what do you because quite honestly i'm i'm very happy with all the new innovation but yet when i go on linkedin and i read what's going on linkedin it's not there Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I don't, I'm not being negative. I'm trying to be positive. I think there's yeah, tons yeah, of yeah. really innovative people out there. And that's the reason why before I used to laugh at B-Sides and Lightning Speak. I think those are the greatest conferences. I think that having an open podium to hear so many points of view, right? Yeah. You, you need a beer. That's all you need is you need just beers to get through the crap that you've heard a thousand times because someone's going on stage and they're going to say something profound. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I, and I'm, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm um, a big, I believe in what you said there. Uh, sorry, Jeremy. Um, did you want uh, to say so? Oh, I was a big, big believer in, um, we have Jeremy in that. Lift, What's that for? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I saw a Philadelphia Flyers banner there, but I, I don't think it is right. But he has a Flyers banner. Hockey no <laughs> Kings championship flags. Thank you. I got the next Stanley Cup oh, champion yeah. right here. I don't know how they the have Vegas. hockey in California and Florida, <laughs> but I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Listen, you know, I take flyers over the devils any day, but that's a different discussion. So go on, Mo. <laughs> <laughs> now he's frozen. So I'm still, I'm still a diehard Philadelphia sports fan. Even I, I grew up in Philly, and uh, I, I, I buy the NFL package every year. Um, you know, I. I I follow the Phillies. My family's a huge baseball family. Uh, my dad was a pro player earlier in the days, um, you know, very early in the, in the 30s, <laughs> 30s and so forth. And um, all my, my nephews and, uh, you know, are college ball players and everything. So we big, big baseball family. So we follow the Phillies, the Eagles. Um, if the Sixers could get out of their own way, I'd follow them. But, man, I, I, it's, it's, I follow them, but it's hard. It's hard, man. It's hard. <laughs> Listen, so, so you've got – I was going to go with the Bundesliga hockey and the Bundesliga soccer out there. We, we're going to have to we have to have a different trip, and we're going to we're going to deal with the the, the Bundesliga stuff out there. You got some kick ass. Ooh, that'd be fun. You know what? You know what? And I know you love Philly. Here's my problem with Philly. I love going to stadiums that love their team, but yeah. I don't want to beat the shit out of me if I don't root for them. <laughs> Right, Philly, just Philly. root for him. <laughs> you can be, you can be a silent hater. <laughs> yeah, silent. Yeah. I mean, and I, now we've I, come to the top of the hour. Oh, stop the top of the hour. Go out to some. I'll tell one th one thing before you quit though, because this is a good story. Um, with I, I, when I was younger, I went to, uh, I flew to New Orleans with a friend, friend, a couple of friends actually, to uh, watch the Eagles on Monday night football, right? And it was a package deals, you know, early, early day. Um, it was still back on the day when you could smoke on airplanes and do things like that. So it was more of a chartered flight, Philadelphia, taking Philadelphia fans down to see to a Monday night football game. Um, and they lost, right? <laughs> and when we get back, we're going back to our hotel. And it, it was, I felt, I felt at risk in the, in the, in the stadium there, right? A little bit, because uh, we were like one section of Eagles fans and it was it. Uh, but then when we get back to our hotel, our, our uh, the manager was like, "Oh, come on! It wasn't that bad. We'll open up free free drinks for everybody. Oh, for uh, to feel better. So it, it worked. Wait, wait! Free but drinks wait, are good. We we got free drinks and it stopped. Yeah, we started again at free drinks. So, uh, so <laughs> that, was, that was the end of the story. What else? Is, what else is there? <laughs> <laughs> free drinks for everybody that's the best part of the story yeah. <laughs> listen I, I think i think i love sports it's the one thing i'm in COVID 19 is, is the sports i do have to say something that i've learned in the last month is that you take away my sports 
You take away going to the movies and the restaurants, and I become a, an Uber programmer again. I love, I love what we do. This is a great industry. Mm -hmm. It's fun as hell, you know. Yeah. And we're gonna get hockey shirts, Mo, and we'll we'll send you one when we get it. We, really? We get hockey shirt. Okay. Okay. Oh yeah. They're gonna be we'll sweet. Get you, uh, we'll get you on Skype next time or something. You're broken up. We're gonna make fun of Zoom pretty soon. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> we we've uh, we're using we're using Teams internally, and actually, I I I, uh, I like it. You know, it's a it's pretty good it's a pretty good platform so far. But uh, I, I had a, a call with a customer the other day, and they had a, it was a Skype call, and I found myself looking for the buttons. I'm like, where's everything, man? And I had a, I had a it was, it, was it, it felt, it felt like it was, it was felt a little old school. Let's say I'm, I'm happy for the team's piece. Right. So that's, yeah, that's we're good. Gonna try, we're going to try this with teams <clears throat> and see if it's better. We'll, we'll compare the two podcasts or the video cast. I don't know what we call these anymore. Yeah. And, um, uh -oh. <laughs> but, but, but listen, dude, I mean, I appreciate you taking time with us. And I know this has been more of a, a bullshit session than anything else. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of interested in, and insight and some other stuff. And we're going to ask you for some notes and we're going to put it against the, the podcast because okay. I, I think that there's a lot going on at McAfee right now and yeah. nobody's talking about McAfee. I hate to tell you, I mean, they're talking about all these, every little venture capital thing that's out there, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the challenge today, right? Is how do you, you know, how do you make noise in a, in a very noisy, a noisy environment. Right. And that's, uh, I'll tell you, it's, we, we got to work hard, you know, to, uh, you know, to get that, to get that name, to get the name out there to, and, and I think you, you know, when you, when you adopt, uh, I wanted to, I was, was going to say this earlier was that, um, you know, adoption of cloud services, for example, you know, it, it, it forced it because the customer can switch so easily or well, relatively easily, you know, at least from a contractual point of view, um, you know, you have to get in there and speak about the outcomes, right? Because customer buys, you know, licenses for these applications for security. Um, but you don't go in there and you're not talking to them about their next, their next, um, you know, the, the next things they're doing or consulting on that, or you're giving them, you know, providing, you know, domain knowledge and knowledge transfer. You're not, you're not there, right? You're not there. So you, they can, they can, that's where I, I think, you know, we're, we can, we're, we're accelerating, but we, you know, we have to make, we have to, make noise in that, in a very crowded environment. And, and yeah, but really we have fun. to be good advisors to our customers at the same time. Cause there's also, you know, hype out there, of course, as usual. <laughs> and, and I think, I think McAfee has the challenge of, of shaking off some of the stigma that it has with some of its products and really telling the world that these are the, the products that we have yeah. and, and ignore the deficiencies in our endpoint that used to exist, look at us now, and what can we do for you now, right? Yeah, absolutely, constant, constant, that's the, that's like the number one, one of the number one conversations we wanna have is, you know, everybody, and it's a, kind of an all hands on deck approach, right? You know, you can't just rely on marketing it, you know, everybody's gotta be talking about that. And we have made great quality improvements on the, on the endpoint, just as an example, but we have great cloud security products, cloud native security. Um, you know, we've got a great architecture that we can deliver for, app security or workplace security or, or, or OT security, uh, you know, IT, OT convergence, you know, that's a big, that's a big topic. And, you know, those are the you know, enterprises today are interdependent. So if you're just thinking about, you know, a hot technology that to plug a gap here or a, um, you know, if you're not thinking about your enterprise as sort of one thing, um, you know, you, you're going to, you're definitely going to have exposure. Yeah, and we, we, we say do the basics first. Who doesn't? Yeah. Right? I mean, you <laughs> talk about it. Yeah. You talk football and you talk to Phillies and, 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 and the reality is, is that you got to get the basics first. You don't need a freaking good kicker or punter. You need the basics. You need to control the line. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta draft, you gotta draft based upon need, not draft based upon that guy's sexy, right? It, it, it's hurt Philadelphia. It's hurt so many teams. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're going to have a sports to security sponsorship some, sometime. All right, so, so That'd be great, dude. years are done. And so, 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 so. <laughs> All good. <laughs> Still got a few drinks left. <laughs> How can you drink 12 oh. ounces in an hour? I'm like. You are, you're nursing. Do you need a nipple for that thing, Al? Come on. 
All right. All right. Next time, I expect cool glasses from you guys. There you go. <laughs> go out and go hunting Absolutely. for cool glasses. Sure. We're gonna do hockey shirts. We don't have glasses yet. We got the we got the, the we're gonna have the trash panda logo out in a couple couple days, couple weeks. Okay. And and we'll, and that's, we'll and that's for for fluency for fluency. No, no, this is for beers and bikes. For beers and bikes. Oh, right. Okay, cool. cool. And then you're gonna get a fluency patch and a and a Fortify twenty four seven. Nice. Know? <laughs> and, and it'll be good. It'll be really good. So okay, I appreciate cool, it, Mo. We're going to bring you back on when we actually have people watching this. <laughs> <laughs> but, we're just, hey, we're just fun, the man. early I appetizer. Really... There you go. <laughs> we love you. Mo, it was okay. great meeting you and uh, appreciate that and your insights. Thank you. Right. Thanks, guys, for the invite. Chris, Al, Jeremy, right. thanks again. Uh, my pleasure. All right. So we'll call thanks, that Mo. a wrap.